to the BSC Liverpool Online Service. Little 
middle of a storm
Hello. Um, England happens to be home to the largest grapevine in the whole world. Um, it's based at um, Hampton Court in London and it was planted over 250 years ago in 1769. Um, in terms of its circumference at its base, it's just short of four metres wide or the circumference is around four metres. And uh, its longest trellis, its longest branch, uh, is around 36 metres long. Um, and I'd, why am I telling you uh, about this? Well, apart from it, you know, I like interesting facts, um, or maybe not so interesting, depending on what you think, is this morning, or this, today I wanted to talk about John chapter 15 and Jesus, the true vine. Um, so that's our scripture reading. So I'm talking about Jesus, the true vine. If you turn with me in your Bibles, um, I'm using the New Living Translation. And these are the words in John chapter 15. I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to the Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father has told me. You did not choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command, love each other. That was verse 17. So today I'm going to see how my time goes, but I've got three key points. Um, I'm going to talk about Jesus, first of all. I love talking about Jesus. And, um, you know, the Bible says that we should fix our eyes on Jesus. So we're going to just spend a bit of time just talking about Jesus and what we can learn about him from this scripture. Um, the second point I'm going to talk about um, is being pu pruned and purified because there are key themes within this passage, isn't there? The pruning and the purifying. Um, and also going to talk about abiding in him, uh, abiding in Jesus. Um, now, the first verse verse one can in some way seem a little bit of an in, innocuous verse 
but there is an awful lot just even in verse 1 where where it says these words it says i am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener or in some versions the gar the vine dresser um now there there are some just amazing um, parts in this and there's, there's there's actually four little bits within just this one verse that I just wanted to bring out for you just now and the first thing is when Jesus says in this verse I am uh, in your bible if you notice in some versions that will be in capitals um, because that I am that he uses there is actually referencing right back into the old testament um, when Moses um, was being called and he had to go on his mission to Pharaoh and he was terrified and he said, well, who, who is it that's sending me? What's your name, God? And God tells um, Abraham uh, in the book of Exodus and around verse three, chapter 3, verse 14, he says, I am who I said, uh, who I am. Um, and it's I am that is sending you. And so if you if you know this, then so Jesus is making a very bold statement right in this um, verse here because he's saying I am and he's using that Old Testament name for God. So Jesus is actually here. He is saying that he is God because he's using the Old uh, Testament name for God. And I just wanted just to just to quickly reflect on how amazing it is that that kind of. God's name, the, the name that we get introduced to in Exodus uh, is the great I am, I am. Um, just that, that thinking about who God is, it tells us so much. Um, for example, I am is in the now, um, but it's kind of also eternal um, because God is I am, you know, thousands of years ago and he will be I am. And so that that name I am tells us that our God is the eternal God. He's outside of time. He's the everlasting God. That's how come he can give us everlasting life because he is the eternal God. Um, the other thing about that I am for me is that I am. It's not like it's a thing. You know, I am is a being. And, you know, we can see from this scripture as well that our God is has kind of human attributes we are actually made in the image of God and so we kind of have his attributes if that makes sense and God has personality he has emotions he has feelings he has love and we in later in this passage it talks a lot about abiding in God's love and so also in that word I am we see that God is a being with you know it's it's not he's not a thing he's a being with emotions and that notion isn't there there's that song you know God from a distance God is watching us well well that's actually not true because God is very near and he cares um so that I am um is a being I, I think the other thing about I am um he doesn't need anything else I am, it's kind of saying, I'm self-sufficient, self-sustaining. Uh, God wasn't created by anything. He is the creator. Uh, he sustains life. He sustains the universe. Um, I am, it's just, I just find it so amazing, um, you know, that the kind of, just, just the wisdom in that for me as well, you know, I'd have never have thought of something as clever to think that God could have be called that I am. Um, and the other thing that's amazing for me about just this I am statement is that it's also the foundation for revealing specific things about God. Um, so in the Old Testament, you know, there are some specific examples about who God is, is God our banner, God our peace. Um, and in the New Testament and in this passage, God is revealing something about himself. He's saying, I am the true vine. So there's an aspect of him that we're learning about in this passage this morning. Um, and in fact, John uh, loves using this I am description in the Gospel of John. So he uses it seven times. Uh, so there are seven. There are six other I am statements. I'll just quickly tell you what they are. Jesus is the bread of life in John chapter six. He's the light of the world in John chapter eight. Um 
He is the door to the sheep in John chapter 10. He's also the good shepherd in John chapter 10. He is the resurrection and the life in John chapter 11. And he is the way, the truth and the life in John chapter 14. So, yeah, it's just, just amazing just that this, you know, the I am statement as well. Then we go on to the next part of this. So if that wasn't enough, I am. Then Jesus says this. He says, I am the true vine or the true grapevine. Now, that in itself struck me because why did he need to say he is the true grapevine? There's, in scripture, no word is wasted. So there must be a reason why he's the true grapevine. Well, to the hearers of this scripture... Uh, at that time, they would have understood the significance of the true grapevine. You see, in the Old Testament, Israel, the nation of Israel, is often referred to as a vine. And um, if you remember, kind of the nation of Israel was God's hands and feet on the earth at that time. They were meant to be revealing God to the nation so that people could look to Israel to see to learn about God and to know God. And yet we know, don't we, that throughout the Old Testament that the nation of Israel failed to follow God wholeheartedly. And at various times during their history, they actually rejected God and uh, went off and went for other idols or they didn't listen to what God is saying. And the whole Testament is littered with all the examples of their unfaithfulness. And so this would be quite strong to Israel because they're, they're the vine. Um, and yet Jesus is saying, actually, I'm the true vine. I, you're, I'm the one you are waiting for. Um, and in this message, again, he's declaring his sovereignty. He's declaring his God. He's declaring that he's the saviour. I'm the one that, you're the way, that you've been waiting for. I am the true vine. I'm, I'm the real thing. I'm the one you've been waiting for. And the Bible's very clear, isn't it? In fact, in one of those I am statements I mentioned to you before, Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, the only way to the Father is what the full verse says. Jesus is the saviour. We don't need to wait for anyone else. Uh, he He is our saviour. Um, and, you know, when we look at the Old Testament, I'll just give you some references of, of just so, so that you know for information. So the times when Israel is mentioned as that vine is in Psalm 8, where he's the vine brought out of Egypt. In Hosea chapter 10, where it talks about Israel being a vine but being unfruitful because of idolatry. In Isaiah chapter 5, they produced wild grapes. Uh, and also in Jeremiah, they were the wild vine. And in Ezekiel chapter 15, the useless vine. So this is the biblical scripture. So Jesus is really, you know, it's amazing. He is God and he is the real thing. He's the saviour. He's the one uh, we've been waiting for, that we can put our trust and our hope in. He is the true vine. Um, The next thing I just wanted to um, talk about just in terms of of this as well um, is that Jesus then says, I am the true vine, and we're going to talk about what, why he's talking about a vine in, in a moment. And he says, but my father uh, is the gardener, is the vine dresser. Now, again, just the radical of this, that Jesus calls God his father. Now, you know, to the hearers at, at, of that at that time, that was a real radical thing in the Old Testament. Nobody called God Father, or it's not that I'm aware of. And Jesus is telling us here that he is the Son of God. Isn't that, you know, he, he is the Son of God. And we know, you know, from what the Bible is really clear for us. And in fact, he calls himself in some parts of, Jesus himself called himself the Son of Man. So he's he's the, both the Son of God and the Son of Man. And we know that's why Jesus is the Saviour because he is the only one who is fully God. He's the, his God is his father, um, but that he was born of a human mother, Ver- Mary, uh, the Virgin Mary. We've just celebrated Christmas. And so that is the uniqueness of Jesus. He is the John chapter 
3 verse 16, that famous verse, isn't it? Um, he is the one and only begotten son. He is the one, the only one, uh, because he's unique, he's fully God, he's fully man. And so therefore it's through um, his death that he died in our place for our sins and our failures. He took them, even though he was perfect and he give us, gives us his his perfection if we believe on him. Um, and so it's just amazing here that Jesus is able to say that God is his father. And that is a tremendous thing for us because Jesus paved the way that we can have a relationship with God and not just God as in God the universe and he is that and he's sovereign and he's the Lord and you know sometimes we relate to him as in his sovereignty his awesomeness his grandeur his you know he's oh God almighty but yet we can also call God our father and we can come to him as a father we can pour our art out our hearts to him in prayer we can speak to God and relate to him and come close to him and, and be intimate with him. And in fact, this whole passage around the vine uh, is very much about intimacy uh, and relationship, that whole abiding or uh, remaining um, ethos here is, is about that. So I just thought just in one verse, there's just so many amazing insights there just about who Jesus is and how uh, amazing um, he is. Um, the next verse, um, verse two, it says that he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit and he prunes the branches that do produce fruit so that they'll produce um, even more. Now, for me, there's two things that happen here. So there's the kind of getting rid of the stuff that's not producing anything. So, and if we think, we know later, um, I think it's in verse uh, five, that we are the branches, right? So this is, when he's talking about cutting off branches of mine, <laughs> Uh, just in case you thought you were something amazing in this passage as you know as Christians wear branches um, and, and, that, and I think maybe that's a good humbling thing for us to actually remember who we are Jesus is the vine we're, we're just we're branches we're not even the fruit we're, we're in this particular thing we're we're branches um, but and this you know he cuts off the branches that don't produce anything and for me, what that's saying as, as a Christian, and it does say he cuts off every branch of mine. So this particular verse is speaking to us Christians. There is a verse later that's speaking about non-Christians where he talks about gathering uh, all of those who don't remain in him uh, in a pile to be burned in the fire because they're useless branches. So that's a picture of what will happen to people who haven't put their faith in Jesus and the judgment um, that is to come so that's in here but in this particular verse he's talking about the branches of his um, and the works that he is doing in us as Christians and as we submit to God as our father that he cuts off in our lives the things that's rubbish uh, the sin and in fact I'm really glad that he does that because I don't want to be the same uh, as I was 10 years ago. I want to be growing. I want to be improving. I want to be more like Jesus. I want people to know that I'm a Christian because they can see God in me. And the only way that that, that is possible is for me to be as much like Jesus, to have close fellowship with Jesus so that others can see Jesus through me and then come to a knowledge of Jesus for themselves. So although it's hard to think that God cuts off in our lives anything that doesn't bear fruit and he wants to get rid of them, um, that actually it's a good thing, although you can feel it's a bit painful um, because he's saying, I'm going to cut off everything that doesn't uh, produce fruit. So the rubbish things, the bad things, you know, God is working in us to, make, to get rid of all of the rubbish and to leave only the good. Um, and that's where we're working out our salvation with fear and trembling. We're continually working out our salvation. And so 
we need to be, you can see why we need to be remaining in God, to be close to God, to for him to keep speaking into our lives, to change us and to transform us into his likeness. The second one is a bit more interesting because not only does he prune the bad stuff, but the fruit bearing branches, he also cuts back that they might produce more fruit. He prunes the fruit bearing branches as well. So I've, I found that quite interesting because this is maybe the things that you're actually doing quite well. Um, that you think, oh, that was good or I like that about myself. <laughs> and God comes with a pruning for to, the pruning scissors, um, even to maybe some of the good things. Um, and, you know, sometimes perhaps that might give you an answer this morning because or this, today, depending on what you've been going through. And um, you might be feeling actually this bit of my life, you know, why God are you cutting that? Why am I going through this difficulty? You know, it doesn't seem fair. This is this is a good thing. Why have I why am I suffering? I've done something good and I'm suffering for it or well, I don't know, but just maybe God is actually wanting to produce even more fruit. And the thing that is already good, he wants it to be even better. And so maybe he's wanting to teach you something to make that element of your life that's already good even better. Because that's what God wants to do. He wants to produce even more fruit. And sometimes even the things that we think are good, if we just settle for them as they are, we might actually be limiting God. Um, be, and actually God has got something even better for us. And so it's just to say to you to maybe submit to the pruning. Um, and I know that it's 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 hard to think about that. Um, but, you know, let you know, God cuts back cuts off the things that are rubbish but also he cuts back the things that are good to make them uh, even better um and you know vines need an awful lot of pruning just so you know um vines can grow um 10 12 to 15 feet <laughs> or a couple of meters uh, each year some vines can grow an inch a day um, but they need to be kept back usually to about nine feet to really um, bear fruit. And, you know, I was telling you about the um, vine in Hampton Court. Well, that vine gets pruned four times a year. Uh, it gets pruned in spring because they get lots of new shoots. And so they, they select the ones that they think will be the best. So they cut off some of them. They prune it again after flowering so that re they reduce the number of, of um, bunches of grapes. Then they, then they, in the summer, they cut off lots of the leaves so that it gets more sunlight. Um, and in the November, uh, they cut it back uh, just before it goes into winter uh, to restrict its growth during the winter period so that the, the new growth comes in the summer. So I just thought it was interesting, again, just in terms of that pruning and the times that, might, that God might prune us and what he might do <clears throat> to cut off the things you know the leaves and other things so so just a bit about um pruning and cleansing um i think i'm probably only going to get to about three verses this morning this morning because there's so much to cover or this afternoon perhaps when you're watching this um so verse three um in fact i will probably get to verse four it says you have already been pruned and purified by the message that I have given you or the word that I have given you, it says in some versions. I'm not going to spend too long on this one because I want to get to something else. Um, but again, this is, tells us this is by faith. You have already been pruned and pur purified by faith in me, by the word I have given you. So if we receive the word of God, and actually, that's that's what we do, isn't it? When we give our lives to Jesus, um, what changes is we take a step of faith and we say, from now on, God, I'm going to trust you with my life. I'm going to give my whole life to you, God. And we take a step of faith. And so and actually throughout the Christian walk, um, how we grow is that we take steps of faith. We trust God. 
even though our circumstances might say differently, we trust the word. We put our faith in what the word says um, and that is what prunes us, that's what purifies us, it's our faith and our knowledge of what the word says and our belief in God. And again, if you just think about your Bible again about Jesus, just quickly, just for those who like the extra bits, John starts his gospel, doesn't he, with saying that Jesus is the word. <laughs> and I love that as well, because Jesus shows us how to live, isn't he? And he is the word. So it's talking about the word here. Jesus is talking about the word of God, the Bible as well, that wasn't written then, but that was cut to come, but also himself uh, as the word. So just, just again, just the amazing uh, thing about who Jesus is. He is the word. And But it's by faith in him that we are changed and transformed, that we are pruned and purified as we constantly trust him and put our faith in the word above our circumstances. And I just wanted to say, just for pausing here for a moment, just a reminder about how important it is to read your Bible every day. Um, I'm trying, I'm also trying to memorise scripture, just so you know, I'm not, not particularly good at it, but I'm trying every day to kind of try and memorise a verse of scripture um, and reading a few chapters of the Bible a day. I, I try and read the Bible in a year, not saying I'm always good at it, or I get it right, but I'm, you know, that's my aim. And I just wanted to remind you how important it is to really know the Bible, to know the word of God. As a Christian, we need to be reading the Bible um, every day. Um, I'm going to just kind of finish on just talking about abiding or remaining. Um, and this kind of starts to come in in verse 4. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Now, I, do you know what I find funny about this is, it seems a bit of a weird words to put together, that a branch should remain in the vine. The word remain. I mean, I was just imagining walking down a street and saying, oh, look, there's a branch remaining in a tree. <laughs> It, it it kind of in our human or at least in my human logic um that kind of whole idea of you know abiding in a, in the vine um a branch and yeah it just seems a bit odd but obviously you know god is his ways are much higher and he's trying to bring a very different emphasis and sometimes the cleverness of language i think in the bible is one of the things that amazes me as well and helps me to know that it is the word of god is that only, you know, just to kind of think to put those things together um, is amazing to me. So, and it's obviously he's trying to emphasize something here. This word remain or abide uh, is in this passage a number of times. It's a key theme. Um, and, and it kind of takes, it says we've got a choice. We can choose whether or not we remain or abide. Um, so it's a, it's a choice. They're in fact, there's, it's one of the verses, there's the if word, if, if you remain in me. Um, also, abiding does speak of intimacy, remaining, abiding, that being together, that being in unity, harmony. Um, and and actually as well, we we get this kind of later on, it talks about abiding in my love. So he, he kind of then moves to talking something about what that abiding is, about it and where to remain in him, where to abide in him. And I think for me, God is saying really that we need to be in constant connection um, with God. That And he gives us a promise here, if, if you remain in me, I will remain in you. Um, what an amazing thing that is, um, that God is with us, abiding with us, not just kind of with us, watching at us, which he is, but also abiding with us, being part of us, being kind of knowing what we're going through, feeling every thought, that kind of abiding, that living together, that being together. Um, and that's what, you know, Christianity is not about a distant thing. 
It's not about rules and regulations. It's about a relationship with God, abiding um, with him, um, an unceasing connection. Um, also, when we look some further into this passage, it's also very much about prayer and um, and that kind of communion with God, that kind of having that connection. And we can connect with God any time of the day any, any or night. Uh, sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and if I can't sleep, then I think, well, rather than doing anything else, I may as well just pray and spend some time with God. Um, sometimes I'm in work and I'm about to go into a meeting and I'm th I just say, God, please, will you just be with me? Help me in this meeting. Um, as well as having my set prayer times uh, each day where I spend time with God, just thinking about him, praying, um, communing with him. Um, but this is the key to the whole thing. And I think sometimes we have to watch that we can get so busy doing. Maybe we're thinking we're doing good things and maybe they are good things. But if they're not, if we're not still spending time with God and we're focusing on God while we're where they're doing those things, I think it's just a reminder this morning or this afternoon to make sure um, that we are abiding. Um, and we know how to do that. It's prayer. It's the word. Uh, it's faith. Um, I'm coming to the end of our time now and there's so much um, more that I could say. Um, but, you know, there is some tremendous rewards from having this constant abiding with God. Uh, not only do we get to have a relationship with sovereign, awesome God and know him as our father, that we can have constant communion with him and he desires that. He wants to have that communion with us, which is just amazing. Um, but also it talks about when we have a life like that and a life of the word, that when we pray, God answers our prayers. Um, and I'll, I can. there's so much more I could say even about that. Later in the verse, it tells us that we get to have his joy and that we experience joy um, when we have that. And also that we can abide in love and uh, know very deeply what it is to be loved and to have that um fulfillment of being totally loved so there's so much more i could say but that i think that's enough for today um just to think that reflection on jesus a true vine that you know jesus is god that he's sovereign that he wants to do a work in us that's sometimes difficult because he wants to both purify us and prune us um but also that we need to abide in him by faith by prayer by reading the word, and when we do that, there's tremendous uh, rewards. Thank you so much.